Davey D from Pacifica hanging out with you and sitting in the room in front of me here in Cleveland, the home of the Republican National Convention, uh, Donald Trump's temporary home, but in the building um, is Cornell West and Dr. Jill Stein uh, sitting next to each other, hanging out with each other in Cleveland. <laughs> I, I would take it that you're not fans of Donald Trump, you didn't come to see him. No, this is a city of Gerald LeVert. Gerald LeVert believed in telling the truth and bad witness, even as a young man, and to be able to keep focus on poor people and working people here and around the world. That's why I'm sitting next to my dear sister, Jill Stein, because she's a presidential candidate that comes out of a legacy that says, I want the empowerment of ordinary people. Jill, what brings you to Cleveland? Well, you know, we are here as the counter convention. We are here in the spirit of the people. Uh, we're here at this AIDS Foundation event, uh, standing up and, and lifting up this cause of people who have been, you know, outcast and downtrodden and neglected by society whose needs are so urgent and who are really a symbol of so many people who are locked out of health care, who are locked out of jobs, who are locked out of a decent future. So I'm here to meet with Cornell. I'm here to be a part of the convention today of the oppressed. Um, we're here to assert that the people are alive and well outside of the Republican convention. Let me ask you this, Cornell. You stomped pretty hard for Bernie Sanders. Um, and many people saw him as uh, the very progressive candidate, somebody who can make things happen. People who I think have, you know, may have a little bit more maturity in their politic or maybe a little bit more deeper knew that he would eventually um, not only endorse Hillary and get behind her, but they knew that the Green Party uncompromisingly had the values that many people have wanted from Jump Street. Why do the dance with Bernie? What was the purpose of that, knowing that eventually he would get behind Hillary? No, I was convinced that Brother Bernie could win. I thought that the Clinton machine, as corrupt as it is, would run out of gas. Uh, and it, it seemingly hasn't. And therefore, one can see so very clearly, not just the limits of the two-party system, but the ways in which the Republican Party represents the right wing of corporate class and the Democratic Party represents the centrist wing of the corporate class. And I wanted to be with a candidate and party that was telling the truth to the American people about both their suffering and their capacity to engage in transformation of society and the world. So I have the same principles. I'm the same old school, old fashioned brother tied to truth and justice. But I'm thoroughly convinced that uh, our only option for me as a human being, and I hope many, many, many others, is to get behind my dear sister Jill Stein and the Green Party and to look at the connection between environmental justice, racial justice, economic justice, uh, social justice, and also the spiritual issues. What I love about Sister Jill is she has a uh, uh, embrace of the spiritual crisis that she stands for, a deep love and a integrity and a sensitivity and we're in a spiritual decline in American civilization. We've got to shatter indifference and callousness and that's what I see in my dear sister, not just in this election but in our whole life. Dr. Stein, um, you know we talked with you in, um, four years ago in Charlotte and we know that the Green Party, nationally speaking, has challenges, even just getting all the names on the ballots, you know, being on all the, having your names on the ballot in all the states. In the four years since Charlotte, what has the Green Party done um, so that you could have more inroads? In, in my mind, I would have hoped and would have thought that the Green Party would have been Bernie without him. You know what I mean? You would have had that presence, that people would have rallied immediately. Um, without having to do a sell or, you know, they would have just known. So in the four years, has the Green Party been able to build? And if so, how do we measure that? Uh, yes, and I, you know, the Green Party is very much a part of the social movements. We've been there in the fight against environmental racism, in the fight for Black Lives Matter, uh, in the fight for 15. Uh, the Greens are very much a, a party of social action 
and of social justice. So we run elections, but that's not all that we do. And you know, to say that the Green Party has had a hard time, you know, uh, gaining traction and gaining strength, it's important to put that in context because it's like you know, compared to what all the other national parties that are not sponsored by corporations have been wiped off the face of American politics. And there is such a climate of fear campaigning and smear campaigning against independent politics that mere survival has actually been miraculous. And I think it's a tribute to the conviction and the, um, and the vision of Greens that they haven't given up. They haven't gone home because there's nowhere to go when you truly see that the crisis is of planetary dimensions and not only ecological, it is economic, it is social, uh, it is a crisis of peace and democracy and of the spirit. And, you know, Greens sort of see this in its totality, so we haven't gone away. I think that's why we have been the one party that has maintained national resistance. We are, I think we have achieved credibility so that what Bernie did, he could not have done outside of the Democratic Party. He had, he had the power of the uh, corporate media, he had the power of the Democratic Party's machines, um, he had uh, the power of organized labor, he had a lot of traditional sort of progressive energy inside the Democratic um, uh, complex that we never could have gotten. And it's only by this sort of tag team approach here that we're able to continue this movement. The Greens never could have jump-started it. Bernie would uh, not have been able to jump-start it had he not actually run as a Democrat. So thank our lucky stars, you know. Thank the heavens, thank destiny that it's worked out in the way that it has because it is the perfect storm for political revolt and transformation. And the Green Party is the one show in town to make that happen. This is for both of you all, and I'll start off with you, Dr. Stein, or Dr. Jill Stein. It would seem like the politics of the Green Party and the fact that you even have members who are deeply involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, that the dance would have been much more tangible, it would have been much more visible, um, the way that you all, I would have thought there would have been a meeting of the minds, um, some sort of collaboration and a lot of um, high visibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, walking and talking together. I know there are certain places where that has happened, but we've just never really seen to say Black Lives Matter and Green Party in the sure. same sentence. Um, what, is, yeah. what do you think it yeah. would take to really bring about that visibility? And then Cornell, because mm -hmm. you have bigged up the Black Lives Matter movement, what's that gonna take to really um, make that a solid coalition and see maybe the Black Lives Matter movement um, really be hand in hand with the Green Party? For good reason, the Black Lives Matter movement and other social justice movements have been very um, skeptical of partisan politics because they have been abused and used and beat up and, and abandoned. And I think their skepticism is entirely warranted against all political movements. And we've been very clear. So when Greens are out there supporting the movement, we don't go there with our logo. We don't go there saying, uh, we're advertising the Green Party and we want to pay back. No, we're there to support the movement. And I think that's the only relationship that there can be. The social movements are the engine of social transformation. Political parties are simply megaphones to lift up those movements and to uh, help uh, promote the message and to serve the movements. So I think it's, you know, that is the appropriate relationship. And, right. and if, there's, if we build trust and if we build community, then, you know, then there will be reciprocity here. But we don't come into it asking for it. We come up to lift up this movement because it is a good unto itself and it is the fundamental driver of change. But the, the Greens are more known, you know, to the average person for environmental justice, you know, wing. We know, when you say green, that's the first thing that people think of. And BLM has kind of, you know, really established a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a movement on its own. At that point in time, don't you think there should be deliberate, like we need to have like a very deliberate, 
purposeful relationship, especially since environmental justice and you know you connect it to urban uh, blight and gentrification and all that sort of stuff. They all kind of bleed into one another. So I guess the question is, what is the relationship with the Greens and BLM? You know, has there been a sit down with Patrice and Alicia or maybe other members that you know that we need to know about that hasn't made the front page? Right. So. In our campaign, you know, the campaign trail for me means going to frontline communities and supporting their work mm -hmm. and uh, bringing uh, people, bodies, attention, press, messaging, etc., bringing our resources to their cause. And so across the country, uh, I have been present at the work, uh, at the marches, at the rallies, at the protests at the sit-ins, et cetera, of Black Lives Matter movement. And, you know, we are here uh, putting out that uh, olive branch, you know, at every opportunity to say we are here and we are ready to collaborate. But we're not here on a contingent basis. We're not here making an ask and expecting reciprocity. And my hope is that uh, this will be, you know, our offer of service will be taken up by more formal aspects of the movement. And the movement, of course, is very decentralized and right. it has leadership all over the place. So we have collaborated with various Black Lives Matter movements. Uh, yesterday in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, in fact, uh, Greens were very much, and my campaign was a big presence uh, in the march and the protest, and uh, we were given, you know, in fact, then they came back to our campaign party after the march. So, you know, we have uh, connections at a very grassroots and decentralized level, and uh, we would be just too happy to build that collaboration in any way that the movement is ready to do. Right. Cornell, because you picked up and you've been involved, you went to Ferguson, Baltimore, you've been around. How do we, um, you know, one, how does that, how do, how do you see that collaboration happening from your end? And two, um, Many people have looked at the BLM movement and see that the, many people um, within it have deep dissatisfaction with Hillary and deep dissatisfaction with, um, obviously, Donald Trump. Oh, yeah. And one of the X factors in this election is that there's a fear for many people that many will sit out and not vote, or at this point, may vote green, at which point you have an older established black leadership that will say this will be a spoiler, this will be a disaster, um, that, uh, that even you two coming together is going to be something that we're going to pay a price for for a long time. So how do you kind of deal with that sort of rhetoric in, in the first question that I asked about bringing mm -hmm. the BLM mm -hmm. and the Green Party into higher visibility and collaboration? Yeah, I'll begin with the second question, though, brother, that if Sister Hillary Clinton cannot make a strong case fellow citizens for them to vote for her, that's her fault. It's like it was Al Gore's fault. So this notion of a spoiler already presupposes a certain kind of paternalism and arrogance as if the Democratic Party owns the vote of fellow citizens. That's a lie. See, they lose the election, they lost the election because they didn't make a case, hmm. period. Now, when it comes to my precious brothers and sisters in the, in, in the Black Lives Movement, there's no doubt, Sister Jill is so right, that there's a, a profound suspicion of any party politics. They've been burned by black neoliberal politicians in the Democratic Party over and over again. Obama, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, Black Congressional Caucus, they come zeroing in, the young folk out there catching hell. They come in from the top. We've seen it in Ferguson and Baltimore and other places, right? And they go back to the president, try to rechannel the rage in such a way that they wait for these long-scale investigations rather than ensuring this police accountability. And these policemen who murder fellow citizens, especially black ones, go to jail. Black Lives Movement say, look, we've seen no concrete results as of yet. We saw it in Oakland with Oscar Grant. That was because of the social movement. That was because of uncle and so forth and so on. How long can police stay in jail? 11 months, he's out sipping tea again. So that you, you understand the deep uh, suspicion. We say, look, the Green Party, social movement rootage, 
spilling over into an electoral political system dominated by big money corporations and banks. We have to make a case, reparations, serious police accountability, dealing with systemic racism, part and parcel of what the Green Party stands for. And then it goes beyond because, in fact, black people have to learn something from the Green Party, too. It's just not just the Green Party learn something from black people. You have to learn something about environmental racism that we haven't hit. You have to learn something about militarism that we haven't hit. Nuclear catastrophe around the corner that we haven't highlighted and so forth. So, and the same is true with the Israeli occupation, for example. Yeah. No moment of anti-Jewish hatred permissible, but solidarity with those who are suffering, in this case, is our precious Palestinians. Where are black folk? Ask the average black politician about Israeli occupation. What kind of answer are you going to get? Silence. Crickets. How come? Fear, cowardice, money flowing. Right. That's what needs to be highlighted in terms of what the Green Party stands for, in terms of what Black Lives Matter stands for, what brings them together, commitment to truth and justice. That neoliberal policies that are adopted and upheld by a lot of members of the Congressional Black Caucus and a lot of black politicals at this point and even punditry. That's right. What's the solution? Do you get rid of them or do they get replaced or are they open for debate and persuasion or is it just, you know, they found these hand-picked folks and they're going to follow the script? Brother, we got to follow Malcolm X, we got to follow Nina Simone, you got to call them out. You know, Brother Bakari Sellers, if he is on the Apex train getting big money from Apex with the conservative people, Jewish lobby. Let me just remind people, Bakari Sellers uh, put out a letter um, actually coming 60, up against you. Absolutely, right, right, attacking uh, me. Uh, attacking you for pushing the Palestinian plight um, to the Democratic uh, um, platform and got 60 people whose names were hidden yes, for the first few days and then finally yes, people got it, but 60 black Democrats to back him, which many people just looked at and was like, wow. You know. Well, we discovered that they, he was plucked out as student by the president of Morehouse. They brought him to Israel back and forth. They've done this throughout black colleges. APEC has the right to do that. I have no problem with uh, defending the rights of uh, indifferent, callous right-wing lobbies that, that don't want to come to terms with the truth to try to sustain their project, but we have to call them out. We call out Apex, we call out the black politicians, not because they're anti-Jewish or not because we're anti-black, because they're wrong, they're unjust, they're cowardly, they're immoral, and that's where we stand. And that's what I love about Sister Jill, that's what I love about the Green Party, but that's what I love about Black Lives Matter, any other movement that's trying to tell the truth and that way justice. My last question for you all, um, the Democratic Party has built itself as being this big tent um, party that brings in labor, brings in browns, brings in blacks, brings in women, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right now, we've just been pretty much talking about the Black Lives Matter movement, but we have an equally uh, diverse population um, that has vibrant movements in the brown community, especially around issues of immigration, to a larger degree, environmental justice, and just the, the global impact of what's going on throughout South and Central America with our policies. Uh, of course, the LGBT community, um, many women who um, you know, have been finding themselves at the margins. How, do, how does the Green Party bring that tent about and bring it in a way that would be different than the Democratic Party? Great. Um, I think we're in a different historic moment where people are not uh, kind of pigeonholing themselves. We may have predominant movements that we're committed to, but there's a, a knowledge out there, you know, intersectionality, uh, a holistic uh, approach to things. So people recognize we are whole people. Uh, we need jobs, we need good food, we need clean air, we need health care, uh, we need a planet at peace, we need racial justice. All of these things go together. Uh, you cannot achieve one piece of this really without achieving it all. Justice comes as a whole. So I think we're in a moment where people have really embraced this idea that we really have a right to a sustainable, just, peaceful world. And we cannot get any one 
section of that unless we go for the whole tamale. In the Green Party we say people, planet, and peace over profit. And I want to just identify what I think is the operative uh, strategy here because it, the vision in my experience is widely shared right now but the question is how do we get there? Mm -hmm. and, and so what I really want to be very clear about is an amazing uh, leverage we have at this moment in this race where 42 million young people and not so young people are locked into predatory student loan debt with no way out in the economy that we have, in the foreseeable economy with the kinds of things that Democrats and Republicans are pushing us towards. Uh, we're not getting better, we're, we're getting worse. And 40, an entire generation, and then some, are basically uh, indentured servants forever. For the and rest of their lives. For, yes, yeah. exactly, this doesn't go away. Right. My campaign is the only campaign that will cancel that debt as we did for the crooks on Wall Street. We bailed them out with the so-called quantitative easing, these little magic tricks, essentially, that the Fed can perform. And you know what would it take to do that? Well, actually, a president could appoint the chair of the Federal Reserve who wants to do this. So in other words, this is effectively presidential power and discretion. 42 million is a winning plurality of the presidential vote. So simply by getting the word out to people who are holding student debt to tell all your friends and tell your family members to come out and cancel your debt by voting green uh, in the November presidential race, we can actually achieve critical mass to make that happen. This defies the prevailing wisdom that we the people are powerless, that we are incidental, that we do not dare stand up and there's no way we can make a difference. But in fact, we have in front of us a real plan for standing up and achieving a victory in this. We can go, not split the vote, we can go and flip the vote. So the underdogs, mm -hmm. us underdogs become top dogs and we can actually turn this thing around. And the beauty of doing this is not only that it doesn't have to go through Congress, it can actually happen, but also that it's a gateway issue because young people who have been the victims of this predatory economy and predatory political system, are they have a big agenda. And it's not just about ending student debt, it's about making higher education free, health care is a human right, the right to a job. We call for an emergency jobs program, a Green New Deal, which will also solve the emergency of climate change. And we call for a foreign policy based on international law and human rights, etc. So this is a rather complete agenda. If you unleash a generation, then guess what? You have the ground troops who are capable of leading the way without whom we have never been able to move forward as a society. So this is actually a transformative solution that is within our reach right now, the minute we stand up with the courage of our convictions and we make it so. Dr. J. Stein, the uh, Green Party Convention is in August? That's right, first week in August. And have you picked Honey Mate or how does I, that work? I'm in some conversations right now about that, yes. Will it so, be Bernie? Um, you know, I certainly offered collaboration with Bernie. He doesn't appear to be interested, which was no surprise. He is a man of his word, and we've actually, the Green Party's been trying to get in touch with Bernie for at least uh, five years, and he has not yet um, found reason to uh, sit down and talk with us. So it doesn't seem to be in the cards for now, but who knows, maybe at some time in the future. Okay, well, we appreciate that. Cornell, last words from you. I think Sister Jill said it with eloquence. Cicero defined eloquence as wisdom speaking. Well, there you have it. Dr. Cornell West, Dr. Jill Stein, we appreciate you all taking time out here. Um, we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back.